Hello, I'm Hugh Manfield and welcome to my next lecture on fluid space theory. Today we're going to be talking about space and time and special relativity. So um, let's go ahead and get started. But before that, let me just remind you that if you want to see the math in detail and text explanations of the process and the derivations, you can always pick up a copy of my book, Einstein and Aliens. And the book contains all the math in the appendices and it has a science fiction story. So today we're going to talk about space-time. Now in the 1600s Isaac Newton came up with his laws of motion which were applied within three dimensions in space and independent time. And this all worked out really well. Um, but in 1905 Albert Einstein came along and said, no, Newton was wrong. Space and time are not separate things. They're actually all one and the same thing. Okay, so why did Einstein come up with that? And why did everyone believe him? Well, at the time, there were some perplexing experiments that had been run, uh, the Michelson-Morley experiments, and they tried to find the motion of the Earth through space by measuring the speed of light. So here's basically how the experiment would work. Let's say you have a car that travels at 100 feet per second and you mount a gun on that car that fires at 1,000 feet per second. So if you get the car up to speed and fire the gun and downrange you measure the speed of the bullet, you would expect it to be at 1,100 feet per second. And that's just reasonable. It's just basic addition and it makes total sense. Well, suppose now you had a rocket that flies at half the speed of light, 0.5c, and a laser that fires at the speed of light, which is called c. So you mount the laser on the rocket, and, and you would expect the laser beam to be traveling at 1.5c. Well, it doesn't work that way. What Michelson and Morley found out was that no matter which direction they pointed their device, the speed of light was always the same. So to explain this, Einstein came up with special relativity. And what special relativity does is it allows you to compare two separate reference frames. There's usually a stationary reference frame, which we see Stan on the asteroid. He would represent the stationary reference frame. And there's a reference frame in motion. And that would be Ricky on the spaceship flying past. And he came up with the Lorentz transformations that make no matter which reference frame you're riding in, you always see light at the speed of light, C. If, if Stan shines a light at the approaching ship, Ricky doesn't see the light coming in faster, you know, the speed of light plus the speed of the ship. No, she sees the light coming in at the speed of light. So how it works is lengths become contracted with special relativity and time becomes dilated. And they, these equations describe how that happens. The L represents the length in the stationary reference frame, and the L prime represents the length of an object in the moving reference frame as viewed from the stationary reference frame. The same thing with time. T represents the length of a second for Stan on the asteroid, and T prime represents the length of the second he sees on Ricky's ship as it flies past. So some interesting things to note about these equations. Um, v represents the velocity, the relative velocity between Stan and the ship. And V is always going to be between zero and C. Because if, if V is greater than C, then the term under the square root radical becomes negative. And then you have to deal with the square root of a negative number which is an imaginary number or a complex number. So to get a real solution, velocity can only be between zero and C. And this is where Einstein came up with the fact that nothing can exceed the speed of light. And that does seem to be true. And the same thing is going on with time, except when we deal with time, the um, term with the radical is in the denominator, which means 
seconds grow longer in the moving reference frame while lengths grow shorter. So if V is zero, then the two terms are equal, then you have the square root of one, and if V equals C, then this becomes zero, so the length of the second would become infinite, and if V equals C, this term becomes zero, and the length of the moving object will be contracted down to nothing. It will become zero. So how does this work? Well, in coming up with the Lorentz transformation, Einstein applied the Pythagoras theorem. Basically, if you have a cube, x, y, and z lengths, the distance along the diagonal, if I place my rod along the diagonal, will be, the distance squared will be equal to the sum of the squares of the individual components. And then you can rotate that rod around and uh, change the x, y, and z coordinates as the tip moves around. And no matter where you put that tip, this relationship stays true. Now, the Pythagoras theorem also works in four dimensions. So, to describe a four-dimensional world with three dimensions of space and a dimension of time, we add the term TC. And then the square of all the components still add up to what's called the space-time interval, um, the square of the space-time interval. So, but there's a slight hiccup with that is that the time is in seconds and um, all the lengths are in meters. So we multiply time by the speed of light, which is in meters per second, and that turns this quantity to have the same units as the length. So everything's expressed in terms of meters. Now, another thing to note about this, everyone usually says that there's three dimensions in time, but you can't disregard this C component. It's time and motion. So the fourth dimension is actually a dimension of time and motion. And that's what fluid space theory brings to the table, is it accounts for the motion part, which is usually dismissed or forgotten about in other theories. So now when Ricky flies past, and she goes faster and faster and faster with each pass, she becomes more length contracted and more time dilated. Now I'm gonna to switch to my wooden pointer so that you know I'm not collapsing the pointer. What's going on? Well, when something becomes length contracted, it doesn't actually get any shorter. I mean, on board, Ricky sees her ship stay the same length, takes the same number of steps to walk forward and backward through the ship, and her clock appears to run at the same rate as when she was not moving fast. So on board, you don't notice any of the changes. You only notice the length contraction and time dilation when you're watching from a stationary reference frame. So what's actually going on is let's say this rod is pointing in the X direction and the camera and the viewer are in the Y direction. So if I rotate this rod from the X direction to the Y direction, you see less and less of it. It appears to get shorter. Now what's going on? Well, you know what's going on because you've been dealing with this all your life. It's a foreshortening effect when you're looking directly onto something. But it's the same thing that goes on with special relativity. So instead of rotating into a direction where you can't see the length, when something becomes length contracted, it's a rotation of motion. So as it moves faster and faster, it's essentially rotating into a dimension where you can't see the full length of it. But the rocket is all still there. So understanding space-time and relativity is really no more difficult than rotating a ladder. Here we see Ricky and Stan exploring the surface of a planet they discovered, and the ladder has blown down. So Ricky knows that the ladder now does not have enough vertical length to reach the hatch. It's all horizontal, but she knows she can fix that by calling Stan over and the both of them can rotate the ladder up against the hatch and they are exchanging length in the horizontal direction for length in the vertical direction. Just like when something goes fast, it's exchanging 
length in the direction of motion, four length in the TC dimension. It's the exact same thing that's happening. So relativity is no harder to understand than standing up a ladder. So now that you know how length contraction and time dilation work in special relativity, you're ready for a deeper look into reference frames and Newton's laws. And that's going to be in my next video. So if you like this video, please subscribe and tell a friend. And if there was anything you found hard to understand, leave a comment or suggest a topic for my Keeping Science Simple channel. Until next time, I'm Hugh Manfield.